Welcome to A Professor's Life, your weekly insight into the world of the Ivory Tower. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Stephen. Hello there. And again, we have super special guest host Sarah Silkey from Lycoming College. Hello. All right. So, folks, uh, before we get deep into the show, I just want to remind you that if you like what you hear, please click like or subscribe uh, wherever you're listening to us from, probably YouTube. Um, you can check us out on Twitter at A Prof's Life. And if you want to recommend show topics or get in touch with us, you can contact us at a professor's life at gmail.com. All right. Tonight's topic is one that's near and dear to every professor's heart. In fact, it's probably the most favorite thing of like all that we do, and that is grading. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> So, we figured uh, we would talk a little bit about how does one approach grading, um, what types of assignments do you give, how do you go about grading those assignments, and how do you sort of find a balance between what you give, what you grade, and the rest of the things that we have to do with this job, because it's not like the only thing that we do is grading, <laughs> although it might feel like that sometimes. Well, th this is also fairly timely. There was an article that just came out in the Wall Street Journal, I believe, that talked about... Uh, I think it's 46% of all grades issued in college right now are A's. So, wow. uh, wow. something. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, I'm an outlier. <laughs> not in my classroom. That's definitely not the case. <laughs> you think about this broadly, you know, where we stand across mm -hmm. all these places. But that, that is obviously a major great inflation that's happening across mm -hmm. uh, universities, across the, the country at all different levels from, from uh, uh, you know, community colleges up. To, to broader research institutions and all that. So this is a broader phenomenon that's happening. Wow. All right. Well, that's actually a pretty interesting, I think, place or thing to put in the context where we have our conversation today because, uh, yeah, I guess one philosophy of grading is just give them A's because they bother you less. <laughs> 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 or it may or may, may not look good for promotion and tenure. Of course, you know, at some places with promotion and tenure, they're looking for that specifically. Are you giving out too many A's? Right. Uh, and that can actually go against you. Um, so, all right, interesting point. So let's go ahead and start the conversation today talking about uh, a little bit maybe about what kind of assignments we give um, that we grade uh, in our courses. And now, Sarah, since you're our special guest host, we'd like to talk a little bit about the types of assignments that you give out and grade. Great, sure. Um, so I'm a history professor, and so the type of work that I assign is very different than I'm sure you do in, uh, in your physics classes. But um, in history, mostly it's uh, papers are the, the biggest part of what my students will produce over the course of the semester. Um, so usually I have them doing at least three essays um, on different topics uh, that are directly related to the course content. Um, a lot of my classes will have at least one of those essays be a research project that they have to do. Um, I also give midterms and finals. I grade participation uh, because I'm a collaborative um, based learner model is the uh, the focus of my teaching and so I like to have that classroom discussion and reward students for coming prepared and participating in a quality manner there. Um, also every time my students do research they do have to give a presentation on it so that their work and the things that they've learned aren't just stuck between them and me. It's something that the entire class can get something out of. Excellent. Yeah, we'll build on all of that here in just a moment. But I'm just going to put all of our cards on the table and talk about the types of assignments we put out, and then we can do some compare and contrast. So, how about you, Stephen? Um, what do you uh, what do you give, and what do you grade? So, it varies pretty heavily if I'm doing this from uh, undergraduates versus I'm doing it with graduates, as you can imagine, um, as well as whether I'm going to do a 300 level class, a 400 level class, or, or you know, an elective versus a core, and all those kinds of things. Um, from a philosophical stand, uh, stance, I'm not a huge fan of grading as is. I go against that notion of grading is not the reason why we do education. The reason why we educate people is to educate them. And so grading is, is sort of an aside. Uh, that being said, hey, I have to grade because we're required to, um, at least in most situations. So uh, with undergraduates, uh, I would, because I, I primarily at this point of my life teach negotiation. Uh, so with undergraduates, I will have uh, usually one or two exams. Uh, we will do quizzes that are uh, 
generally were you, did you open the, the reading quizzes um one of my favorites uh was you know you did a reading what was the company that was discussed in that reading and you'd be surprised by the number of people who couldn't identify the company because they didn't open the first page of the reading um and i will have um i guess the other piece with that one is we would usually have one graded negotiation with, with the undergrads um with graduate students with negotiation what i tend to have there is um it'll be participative so how much are you talking but really not not just talking to talk but rather are you adding something in value for the class we have a, a group assignment generally would be a case analysis that they will have to do and then they will have a graded negotiation and um really their final the, the graded negotiation is really their uh what is their prep for it so do you put the work into it um, are you active? Because I go around and watch everybody do the negotiations. It's usually a two-hour negotiation, so I observe and take notes on that. And then what is the reaction to it? So it didn't matter how well you did per se, but rather that you were involved, active, uh, you thought about it. And when you thought about it afterwards, you actually said, did I do it right? Did I do it wrong? Did I prepare correctly? Did I learn something from this? Any of those kinds of things. So there was some self-reflection that went into it. And then there's PhD seminars, in which case, hey, it's, you know, write a paper. Right, right. Excellent. Well, um, you know, in, in physics, they all have some differences um, from what you so you guys have uh, talked about. Most of my classes, um, there are problem sets every week. Um, they'll have five to ten problems a week unless they have an exam that week. Um, depends on how complicated the problems are, how involved the um, sort of the course is. Um, courses like quantum mechanics that have really hard problems would be closer to five problems a week, whereas introductory physics would be closer to 10 problems a week. Uh, I do quizzes in introductory physics because I stopped grading homework. Uh, I had to stop grading homework because it was just too easy for them to cheat. Uh, caught a whole class doing it, 17 out of 19 one point, and said, all right, now you have to do the problems because I'm not going to grade your homework anymore. You're having quizzes. And uh, that has actually turned out to work a lot better. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later, though. Um, in addition, because we have so many laboratory sections uh, at all levels in, in my department, I usually grade at least, um, you know, the students have a, are handing out at least one lab report per week, uh, which is, you know, basically a shorter type paper. And then, you know, exams, everybody does that. Uh, and then I have to do group work um, grading. Usually one of the labs, instead of doing a lab report, they have to work together as a group, and then I have to grade the presentation and the group work. Um, which is something that I've only recently become comfortable with. It's taken me a few um, semesters because group work was just something that we didn't do in physics. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, I know this is a student, so how am I going to grade this? And how am I going to do this? And uh, some bumps and bruises along the way, but I've got it figured out now. And uh, so that works out pretty well. But those are pretty much the different types of assignments that, uh, that I give. On exams, are, do you feel any pressure to start doing more multiple choice? I mean, physics seems like something you shouldn't have multiple choice for. Yeah, and I don't. Okay. I, well, well, and when I was an undergraduate, we did have a multiple choice section that was like a short, um, a short, like maybe 10 questions, and then you'd have five or more problems to solve for that hour. And all the weight of points was down in the problems, right? Uh, I'm generally right now, I give five or more five to 10 problems. It's almost like a homework assignment for an exam. And I almost always give take home exams because the problems are long. There's not much. And when I was a student and my upper level physics classes were always take home exams. Introductory physics, they're not, they're in class. But uh, upper level, I give them take home. And um, I'm thinking about reintroducing multiple choice though, in even the upper level courses. And the reason is GRE. I'm thinking that it might, if I do a small section of, of multiple choice, it might help better prepare some of the students who are going to graduate school for the GRE. And we have a pretty healthy percentage of our students who apply and go to graduate school for my department. So I think it'd be beneficial for them. That's interesting because I only use multiple choice in my 100 level class um, in my U.S. survey. And the students want multiple choice. They think that it's to their benefit, but all it ever does is keep my average GPA down in the, right. the classes because 
they just don't do math well. And so they, they don't calculate <laughs> the impact that it's going to have on their on their grade overall. Uh, I had one class that actually begged me to increase the number of multiple choice questions because they kept thinking like, well, if I only missed the same number that I missed when I had 10 questions, <sighs> then obviously I will do better. And the, the problem is that you have that many more questions than you have to get right. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a rude awakening. I agreed to let them have more. And I let them compare their results to the other section because I teach two sections of the survey in the spring. And they, they were shocked that uh, they actually did a little worse. <laughs> and it's like, well, I warned you, but you didn't listen. Yeah, that's not good. I, I actually took an advanced class in graduate school on psychometric theory and test construction. So mm -hmm. I understand item response theory and I know how to build an actual exam to, to get the exact grade that I want. Uh, <laughs> then I tell the students about that and say, hey, here's what a perfect exam question looks like. Here's, you know, it has differentiation, you know, high and low. Here's a bad question. And I can get, I can guarantee just about within two or three points what the, the average grade is going to be on this exam. So, hey, what do you guys want to do? Yeah, I see. I'm, I'm really torn with the inter reintroduction of, uh, or introduction, I guess you should say, of multiple choice, especially in upper level courses. And the reason for that is, although you know, they'll many of them will take GRE, uh, and this would be, in a sense, a good preparation for them. I just feel like that is not what physics is. Mm -hmm. Physics is the ability to solve problems, and I just don't feel that the GRE is an accurate reflection of how good somebody is at physics. I also don't think that that process of thinking really reflects how good somebody is at, 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 in the field. So in a way, I, I hate to give what I believe are um, sort of, I don't want to use the word faulty, but inappropriate is probably a better term, inappropriate measures of one's knowledge. But it's almost like, here's some bad medicine. It will make you feel better in the end. You know, it'll help you. Even though it's uh, so, it's something I've been thinking about over the last month or so, um, as you know, my students are, are are awaiting graduate school responses and things like that. I've been thinking, how can we better prepare our students for graduate school? And one way would be to address, you know, how do you tackle the GRE and sort of give them not practice books where they can just blow off, but something they actually have to do for a grade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, have you ever? One of the things you can do with, I think, math in some ways, you know, again, math, physics, you know, in that sort of a problem space that you may not be able to do with some of these other ones would be provide a question where you can't actually solve it. And that's the correct answer. It's not solvable. Have you ever done that? Uh, once or twice. And oh, my God, they hate me for it. Okay. See, this, this is a cultural <laughs> thing here. I, 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 yeah. I, I was talking with one of my friends from uh, Argentina. He said that the natural thing in, in high school is to have problems where that's the case. And so mm -hmm. you, will, you, you can't ever assume that you can solve it. So this is like a 10th you know, a, a grade algebra class and you can't solve it. But that's, that's the learning point. In real life, sometimes you'll encounter these kinds of things. And I know, I'd imagine in, in the U.S. system, you'd be smacked in the face pretty hard if you gave them these things. This is not how we were educated. Uh, particularly now, you know, even at, you know, trickled down to the high school level and earlier doing multiple choice exams everywhere. Uh, they wouldn't have any understanding of having this open-ended stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the multiple choice questions I would assign would be uh, almost all conceptual. Okay. And probably, I would have to go back to the GRE practice questions and see what kind of uh, calculation-based problems they give on the multiple choice. And I would hate, you know, I could do something really jerky, like, you know, the answer is choices are 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, and 1.17. <laughs> <laughs> That would be awful. Um, yeah, no, the problems, I can tell you, as an experience as a student, I had a professor who um, would assign differential equations. He would assign five problems every year from the textbook, and they were the only five problems that he wasn't able to solve from the book. And he had no solve of it. So he figured that the pressure of an exam or a homework solution would still be enough to get a student to solve them. And when I was in the class, no one ever solved any of the ones that he didn't have a solution for. So this was years going on in the case for this gentleman, and it never quite worked out for him. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it did. Maybe after I graduated, somebody figured it out. But uh, I, I, yeah, I, I'm conflicted about giving problems that have no solution. I can see what my teaching evaluations would be like after a couple of those. Yeah. 
Well, somebody here is a full professor, so, I mean, you could take that gamble. <laughs> sure. Not, you know, not that it would matter, but uh, I still, I, I, I want the students to have a good learning experience, not a frustrating learning experience. And mm-hmm. I would be, as a student, especially on the exam, homework would be different, but on an exam, mm-hmm. if I took a take-home exam and I burned 20 hours on an exam mm-hmm. where, you know, seven of those hours was spent on a problem with no solution, they're, they're, not, they're not going to, the way they're trained, as Stephen pointed out, the way our students are trained, they're not going to um, think that there's no solution. They're going to assume that there is a solution because why would Culp give me a problem that does not have a solution? You know, they've never encountered that before. So I will say that that one of the core classes here, the, the make or break, um, the, I guess the weeding class for all engineering and so forth, they do assign problems that can't be solved in the, in the math piece and so that is a take-home assignment and it, it leads to people just dropping the class because they cannot solve it mm-hmm. uh, rather than actually realizing that that's the correct solution that there is no solution um, so you could you if you really wanted to just frustrate you're right you could go that direction I know we've gone off in a, in a different direction but uh, it's still relevant for, for trying to answer about how we were what we're trying to grade out of people how, what we're trying to put yeah. forth well grading philosophy is deeply related to assignment philosophy mm-hmm. Right, because what you're going to give and how you're going to grade it, they're related to one another. Right. You don't give stuff unless you already have a sense of how you're going to grade it. Mm-hmm. Um, in general, um, I mean, maybe a few times I, I haven't, but um, you know, it's like, hey, let's see how this goes. But uh, in general, that's the, the case. Is you know, you, you, I think they're they're definitely related. Um, well, let me talk a little bit about grading group work because that can be interesting. And all of us, I think, uh, do, you know, group work to one extent, whether it's, you know, group discussions or whether it's formal group presentations. Um, Sarah, would you like to talk about uh, how you approach grading group work? Um, Yeah, I mean, just on a a kind of bridging moment here, I mean, I think one of the things that um, Stephen's kind of hitting on is the, how do our students deal with frustration? Right. And I think group work is one of the places where our students have to get tested on how to deal with frustration. Um, and and so I think in, in a lot of respects, it's the thing that my students hate the most about my classes and the things that I think is actually one of the most valuable parts of, uh, of their assignments. So I, I only really assign group work in lower level courses, uh, mostly because in the upper level courses, the emphasis is on uh, the students sustaining larger and larger research papers. And so because of that, that's it often just doesn't fit with, um, with what I'm trying to do in those classes. But I have been trying to like weave parts in, um, maybe not graded elements so much, but try to weave group work into some of the upper level courses as well, because it's one of the things that employers complain about the most is having um, fresh college graduates who just don't know how to work with the people that they're assigned with, regardless of what the people's abilities are that they're going to be working with. And so uh, with my group work, all of my students get the same grade regardless of their contribution to the the group. Um, I force them to work things out amongst themselves. And if one person wants to take charge and wants to do the entire thing themselves, okay, fine. Um, If I notice there's evidence that that's happening, um, those other students will probably lose points in participation for the class because they're not fully engaging in the assignments that they're supposed to be engaging in. Also, often when somebody does take the, the charge like that, they don't necessarily do that great of a job because the projects that I assign are designed to need multiple people to work on them um, in order to be able to get them done successfully in the time that's allowed. Mm -hmm. And so when they have somebody that just wants to control everything and do it all, it's not going to be that great of work in the end. So I I think you raise a a number of really interesting points there. Um, You know, one part that I, I really stick to is this notion of how do you work and play well with others? You know, we had that graded when we were in elementary school, right? You know, I got in, mm-hmm. our grading scale was E G N or E G S N and U, uh, excellent, good, <laughs> satisfactory, needs improvement, and unsatisfactory. Uh, and I, I did pretty well on the on the works and plays well with others. But you're right. There's a lot of people who just you know have these sort of terrible experiences. I, I gave a talk yesterday at the medical school uh, on teaming and, and collaboration mm-hmm. and one of the things I start with is that everybody has experiences in groups going back to you know in college and in college everybody has their bad experience of working on a team you know you had just the people who coasted or whatever 
Um, but if you learn how to work through that, and, and you know that that benefits you in the long run. But it's the people who wait, basically have that bad experience and say, "I don't want to work with other people." You know, I'm just going to take charge. You know, that that's the best way to go. And then they'll find out that they get overwhelmed, they can't do it. Or alternately, they do collaborate, but what their collaboration is is sort of pooled interdependence. I do section one, you do section two, you do section three. And we turn that in, and it's in different fonts and different colors, and it doesn't read. And they, I mean, I was grading something I remember last year. And in section two, they made the strong point that the answer was X. And in section three, they began by saying, some people would believe that the correct answer is X, but the correct answer is not X. It's like, I mean, just at least look at it, the whole thing. One person read over this thing. Um, and so that's a real problem. So, I, you know, there, there's a, I, I run into this, this piece. One is philosophically, why are you doing the group assignments? And I know a lot of other faculty who do group assignments because it's just less grading. Instead of grading 40 assignments, I grade 10 assignments or whatever the number is. And in which case, they don't care what the people actually do and they move on. Um, there's the other one that says, I want you to do something and I want you to create a, something better than, than you as an individual could do. And that's, I think, what you're going with, Sarah. It's that, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, we can't do it individually. We have to do it as a group. Um, there, there's something to be said about teaching people to actually do something as a group. Uh, when I was teaching, you know, the undergraduate classes, one of the big things I would force on is if you're going to do a presentation, I will stop you and say, you're doing this wrong because this is the, 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 the police lineup. Why are there four people standing up there, you know, and one person speaking? Why does this make any sense? You're just standing there and looking strange. And then you want to like draw lines and say, okay, you're approximately six foot tall and you're 5'11". It'll be good. We'll know that you're running away when you're robbing the 7-Eleven. The um, <laughs> You know, the little things like that that are really useful for understanding presentational skills, life skills. You know, mm -hmm. I ignore in some respects the actual product of the group work, but talk mm -hmm. about the process. I'm a, I'm a big process person because I don't, you know, the outcomes are going to succeed or fail, you know, especially when you do something like negotiation. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But if you get the process right, then you'll win more than you lose. You know, you'll have a good outcome more than you, you'll, you'll fail. And so from that perspective, I really want to stop and say, okay, how are you doing this group work? You know? Let's get markers along the way. You've got, you know, six weeks left. Have you met yet? Do you have a topic yet? Uh, do you know what you're doing? Because if it's going to be a week out, trust me, I'll notice. It, it's gibberish. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. It looks like it's produced in one day, and it's writ written by one person or five separate sections that aren't integrated. So a lot of that's what I, what I see when I'm reading this stuff is to what extent does it seem like a cohesive paper? That's, mm -hmm. that's what I grade. You know, content, you know, is it there? Yes, I can check box. I have, I have a rubric. I have, a, you know, some boxes I, I will manage around. But a, most of it I'm focused on is presentationally, does it look like this is something that I would turn into my boss and be okay with? You know, we're in a very applied world in management. And if you can't do this right, you know, you're, gonna, you're walking out there. I mean, a lot of people teaching MBAs, they're walking out there and they're going to be in charge of other people. You know, if, if they, they're middle management and they look like an idiot, that's bad. Right. So, Chris. Yeah, I, I, um, I do. I've just recently, last couple of years, introduced group work into my upper level physics courses. Now, in the introductory physics, they do, you know, they work on labs together, and that's called, and they do recitation problems together. It's basically group work, whatever. Uh, and then the upper level classes, um, they do labs together as well. But I wanted to give them a specific assignment which they had to work as a team in a level higher than the weekly lab activity, whatever that might be. And so what I've started doing is at the end of the semester, they take three weeks to work on a particular experiment. I give them very little direction other than I want you to measure, you know, whatever. Like, so in classical mechanics, maybe I'll say, I want you to devise a way of measuring the coefficient of friction between three different surfaces. Okay, fine. Guess that's, that's the direction they give. I give them, that's about it. And I tell them, um, that they have to work together as a team. Sometimes it'll be the whole class. Sometimes it'll be half the class split up. Depends on the size of the class. Uh, and basically, the outcome is, I don't care about how you parse out the work, um, but what you have to do is you have to devise an experiment, execute the experiment, convince me the results are, are uh, accurate and are, you know, are reproducible, and then you need to write a paper and give us all a presentation. I don't care who does what. I don't care if somebody is a slacker. I don't care if somebody takes control. I, I just don't care. Uh, don't come complain to me about somebody's a slacker. Feel like figure it out yourself. And by the way, you all get the same grade. Mm -hmm. And 
at first are kind of like uncomfortable with it. I'm like, well, welcome to the real world, folks, because mm-hmm. when I'm, you know, working on a committee and we're all the, you know, producing a joint document, we're all getting the same, you know, or to one extent or another recognition. Or when I'm writing a paper with a bunch of colleagues, we're all getting the same level of recognition. And uh, sometimes you have a slacker, sometimes you don't, you know, it's just, you have to learn to deal with this. And um, it's the first year I did it, it was a bit rocky. Uh, but the last couple of years I've done it, it's come off pretty well. I mean, people have, the students have really sort of band together and figured out who's going to do what, who, how, how do you set lines of communication insofar are you going to get any results. I'm not getting papers in four different fonts, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm clearly seeing a, a, a master editor at work for each group, you know, making sure the paper is consistent and the, the presentations are, are getting better with every year. Uh, this particular particular um, semester, or this past semester, I should say, um, had some really good group presentations. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's sort of what I do. And then, you know, I don't really have a formal way of grading. I, I basically say the paper's worth so much, your experimental design is worth so much, and your presentation is worth so much. And I'm just looking for mostly red flags. I mean, it's pretty obvious in physics, at least, if you're doing a group project and, you know, you're you're getting four different values for the uh, coefficient of friction between, you know, wood and glass or whatever. You know, you can tell. You, you, you can pretty quickly spot crap work. Uh, and, you know, it's so... Usually, I have to say, the general results I get, are they give them pretty big grades because they, they step up, or at least enough of them in the team step up to make sure that the group does well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't had a group completely crumble yet, but I haven't been doing this very long either. So, you know, wait and see. But I was inspired by conversations between me, um, Stephen, and Robert. Uh, mm-hmm. And especially some of the st- things that Stephen has talked about, because Stephen's an expert in teams, and so that got me thinking: How do I get my students working in teams better? Because when they get out in the real world, chances are mm-hmm. they're working as a team, yep. just like everybody else. Yep. That's great. So, I'm, I'm, I, I'm impressed whatever. that you have had so many positive uh, results. I always have at least one group every semester that completely implodes, and I uh, and it, you know I warn them ahead of time that they. You know, need to take steps to head it off. That this happens every uh, every time that we do it. At least one group is going to completely uh, just fall apart. And yet, every year they rise to that challenge of making sure that at least one group is not going to be successful. So, how do you put together um, your team, Sarah? I uh, it's changed a bit depending on what I've been doing. Uh, so originally, I did most of my group work in my survey course because I wanted to uh, have a meaningful follow-up to the written assignment that I give them to kind of use those skills and expand on them. Uh, And I decided to create this group project that would allow them to uh, examine a a topic in more depth, be able to use the research and writing skills that uh, and argumentation skills that they had developed and then extend that to be able to uh, give a, a, public presentation with a poster, uh, as well as the executive summary and the annotated bibliography to demonstrate their work. When I began, I decided, okay, the perfect group size is two, because two people can always work it out. And that comes out of my own experience in college, where I was uh, in a group in my chemistry course, and I was with two guys who didn't want to listen to anything I had to say, even though they were doing all the problem sets wrong. And uh, and I was like, okay, well, as long as you have more you know, more than two people, um, clearly there can be some ganging up and all of that. So I made it uh, into pairs, and I had everyone choose their own partner. Okay. And I'm like, choose wisely, because you need to be able to work together and be successful at this. Uh, what happened a couple of years ago, though, is that, um, and, and again, like I would have uh, 14, 15 groups in the class in pairs of two, uh, and I'd have one that would always implode. So a few years ago, uh, some of my colleagues in my department decided they wanted to try developing a house cup competition in one of their lower level classes. And I was like, okay, 
I will join this. And so uh, as in Harry Potter, I broke the students all up at random into different houses uh, and they had to work together throughout the entire semester. So whenever we did small group activities, they worked with their house. Um, they had opportunities to earn points for different things that they could do throughout the semester, like going to attend um, public talks or film screenings and things like that, uh, so that they could amass house cup points. And those could be redeemed for advantages like forgiveness of a quiz grade or um, getting out of the final exam, which was going to be uh, the last possible exam uh, in the whole lineup. And so many of them were gunning for that. Um, and so I decided to make the group project a group of five. So I had six houses, five members each. And because they had the whole semester to work together, I figured hopefully this would work out still. One group every time has to completely implode. Um, but usually group? that's... Was it the Slytherins? Did they... Did they, did they... <laughs> <laughs> I go by colors. Um, I give them color names. So I've got, uh, I've got the rainbow represented. Um, but uh, there's usually at least one group that you can tell the entire semester that there are people who just don't want to be there and are completely checked out. Mm -hmm. And so I can usually anticipate now which group it's going to be that completely implodes. Um, but yeah, it's still still has that uh, that element um, so what well, I think one of the big differences um, for you and for you and me is that you're doing many of the many of these things in your lower level courses mm -hmm. or I'm doing mine in my upper level courses they're a bit more serious students that you know I think that makes a huge difference yeah. and probably why I've gotten the better I tell them though I let them choose their own groups when I do break them up into groups and I tell them mm -hmm. I want to see who stabs who in the back I want to see who forgoes one of their friends for like a student who they think is you know better than they are in the class. I tell them that too. I like to watch like they look at each other and they start they start thinking, oh yeah, we could play this game. I like to plant that seed. Well, and then you have like the three coolest people who are just sort of sitting around staring at things or on their phone, and then suddenly like I need a group. What now? And yeah, that's the one that implodes. Yeah, uh -huh. or they just don't they don't they deliver nothing because they don't even know that mm -hmm. the the assignment's happening. Right. <laughs> Well, we have uh, we have gone to about our half hour point here, and we have more things to talk about. So it looks like we'll have to do a part two. Uh, Sarah, it was great having you on the show. Well, thanks for having me back. I have a, a strong feeling we'll have you again. Your checks in the uh, mail. <laughs> <that's> great. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll wait with bated breath for that one. Yeah, don't cash it. Uh, so, again, for those of you um, that have made it through the whole show, if you like what you heard, please click like or subscribe wherever you're listening to us. Um, you can contact us at a, a Prof's Life on Twitter or uh, email us at a professor's life at gmail.com. If you have show ideas, we'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you again to Sarah for joining us. We have a link to her book, as we talked about last time. Uh, she was on the show, so if you'd like to go buy a, a very interesting book on Ida B. Wells, you should go do that on Amazon right now or your favorite bookseller. And uh, until next time, everybody, just keep – oh, wait a minute. Get back to writing.